Good evening. I think we should get started. It's a great pleasure to welcome Richard Sennett back to the AA. He's an old friend of the AA, and his work, I'm sure, is familiar to most of you uh, in writing, if not in, in speaking. Indeed, some of you will have seen Richard in London quite a lot uh, this past year at the ICA and involved in a series of seminars around cities and social space. Richard's the Professor of the Humanities, which is a wonderful title for a professorship. Professor of the Humanities at New York University. And he's written ex extensively about New York, but also teaches and engages in debates in many other cities around the world. His work particularly looks at the relationships between urban space, history, and social and political change, particularly change. His most recent book, Flesh and Stone, which will be familiar to all of you, looks with particular originality at the history of urban space through people's bodily experience, the changing ideas about the human body. And that's provoked quite a lot of debate here and I'm sure in the States as well. This continues a long development of work about the interaction between civil society and the individual. This evening, Richard's chosen a different title from the one that is advertised, the one that's in the events list, which is typical. Uh, and the title for this evening is The Organic City. And he tells me that he's chosen this because the sap is rising, spring is coming, and he suddenly felt that gardening and uh, the organic nature of the city was perhaps more appropriate than the drier title that he'd chosen before. So we shall see. Richard. Um, oh, so I don't have to lean into this at all. I don't like being wired up like this, so if I suddenly do things like this, just uh, you're very technologically advanced. You know? <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm really glad to, uh, I realize that this is the 25th year since I began uh, coming to the AA, so it's like, I guess, a kind of anniversary for me, and uh, I'm really uh, delighted to speak to you about a subject which uh, uh, is a kind of private uh, uh, passion uh, more than something that I've written a lot about. Uh, and I, I wrote this out, and I know that's a sort of a bore to listen to somebody read something, but as I'm also going to show you slides, uh, I hope this isn't too uh, mechanical. Uh, my subject is one of the great dramas, or great dreams, of all of those who have thought about the city. It's the ideal of, of an organic city. And that dream is about the unity of the human body, the natural world, and architectural design. Uh, as, it, as you know, in the ancient world, the ideal of the organic city appeared in Virgil's Georgics in those passages where the poet compares the art of tilling the soil and making gardens to architecture and urban design. In the Renaissance, this vision of organic design guarded, guided, for instance, the makers of the great Renaissance gardens around the palaces of Palladio. And similarly, in the Enlightenment, the unity of nature and artifice, of poesis and, 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 and natura, was an ideal towards which the makers of gardens and cities aspired in France, Germany, Great Britain, uh, and America. But it's an ideal that's now inflected with a social awareness of the conflicts and divisions within human society. Designers guided by the ideal of the organic city sought to heal these, kind of, these sociological dissonances through the character and the quality of their designs. And it's that effort of healing social division through organic design, which I'd like to just explore to you, uh, with you today. Uh, the relations between the organic and the constructed can, could be imagined to be three-sided, like an equilateral triangle. On one side, 
there's a particular culture's concept of the natural world, a particular its conception of the world of plants and geology. On the second side of the triangle, there's a culture's conceptions about the human body. And on the third side, its concepts of architecture. Uh, now, I should say about this just before I begin, because uh, about this, of course, we're all terribly sophisticated. We know that nature is a construction, that, uh, and so on. I mean, we, 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 beyond all of that kindergarten stuff about essentialism. And for that reason, the phrase organic ideal should signal to us that this triangle of cultural constructions seldom fits together as neatly in reality as it does in geometry. Most cultures have, in fact, dissonant concepts of how the human body relates to the floral and the geological world, or how the body relates to the act of building. The word unheimlich as it's used by Hegel, for instance, refers to the condition of not being at home in the space of the world, a dislocation which we notice in the rupture between the experience of our own bodies and the experience we have of buildings. Now, all of my own work as an urbanist is, I guess, I don't know what these categories mean, but it's Hegelian in that sense. Uh, I'm interested in the way in which people can't reconcile their conceptions or constructions of their own bodily experience with the constructing they do in the world, both the constructing that they do of solid places like buildings and of environments like, like gardens. <coughs> it's that, that notion of rupture is, I guess, is the sort of premise that of not being at home in the world is the premise of my work, and I look at it as a positive phenomenon rather than a wound. That is, it's the provocation to build, right? that ill-fittingness between the body, uh, the natural world, or the construction of the natural world, and building. So that the search for an organic environment, one in which these three dimensions fit together into an equilateral triangle, is itself a human quest rather than a return or a recovery of an essential nature from which we've strayed in error. And as you know, in my book, Flesh and Stone, I, I've tried to trace the history of this quest from ancient times up to the present. And in talking today about the quest for an organic city during the Enlightenment, during the 18th century, I'd like to share with you some of the research that I did for that larger project, but I had to cut out. I wanted to put in uh, I, I did a lot of research on gardens from the ancient world up to the present, but my publisher said, n never. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and they rule. Uh, so, uh, this is some material I couldn't really use in that book. To understand the organicism of the Enlightenment, we have to begin with a fundamental discovery about the human body made at the dawn of the modern era. Um, for more than 2,000 years, medical science accepted the ancient principles of body heat, which governed Pericles Athens. That is, that the body is alive because it's hot. Uh, sanctified by the weight of long tradition, it seemed certain that this definition of, light, of life, which is heat, that the body produces its own heat, uh, it seemed for, for eons that this this principle of the innate heat of the body explained social differences as those between uh, men and women, for instance, as well as between human beings and animals. Uh, men, is, as you know, were thought to be hotter beings than women. Uh, and uh, it's a kind of one-body theory of this, that, that people are, are not d uh, segregated neatly into two distinct sexes, but that there's a continuum of body heats, so that hotter women are sort of, as we would say, more butch, and uh, more epicene men are uh, cooler than warriors. Uh, but it's a notion that heat is life. And the measure of that heat was always the blood. 
Uh, with the appearance of William Harvey's De Modo Cordis in 1628, that way of thinking about the body began to change. Through discoveries that Harvey made about the circulation of the blood, he launched a scientific revolution in the understanding of the human body, its structure, its healthy state, and its relation to the soul. A new image of the body took form, that is, of the body endowed with life by virtue of its powers of internal circulation rather than its innate powers of heat. Now, Harvey made what seems in retrospect kind of simple discovery that the heart plug pumps blood through the arteries and it receives blood to be pumped through the veins. I'll just show you, I mean, I'll show you uh, from the original. What do I, 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 this may all blow up, let's see. Uh, okay, I press this. Oh, that's projector two. Are you on? <coughs> Why, Hugo? Why does it, what, <laughs> what do I press? Ah, there we are, and that goes backwards. Yes. Put, no, press the blue one and go forward, the bottom one goes up, so <coughs> stick with that one. Oh, I stick with the blue one, mm -hmm. all right. Um, for sociologists to give a slide lecture is uh, an exercise in disaster. This is uh, from the original research that Harvey did, and he pointed out something, as I say, to us absolutely self-evident, that blood flows in one direction through the artery and in another direction through the veins. And he asked himself, why is this? Uh, it's a discovery which challenged the ancient idea that blood flows through the body because of the innate heat of the blood and that different bodies contain different degrees of what he called uh, calor anatus. Uh, as I say, male bodies, for instance, being hotter innately than female bodies. Harvey instead believed that circula he circulation heated the blood, that the speed at which the body moved <coughs> heated the blood, uh, whereas the ancient theory supposed that heat in the blood caused it to circulate. Harvey discovered that such a circulation occurs mechanically. It's by the heart's vigorous beat, he declared, that the blood is moved perfected, activated, and protected from injury and decay. He pictured the body as a great machine that is pumping life. And for him, this meant that he had bridged, he thought, the difference between animals and the plant kingdom. Here's a very rare slide. <coughs> Forward? Forward? Okay. Uh, here's a very rare image. Uh, from the second edition of Harvey's book, in which he tries to relate the circulation of the blood to the human being conceived to be like a plant, just as juice flows through uh, a plant, uh, so juice, blood th throws, flows through the heart. And what's radical about this is the notion that there's all life is unified through circulation. That this, a human being, is by its mechanical nature no different than a plant, an animal no different than a plant. Now, up to the 18th century, Christian doctors hotly debated where the soul lurked in the body, whether the soul made contact with the body via the brain or the heart, or if the brain and heart were double organs containing both corporeal matter and spiritual essence. While in his writings, Harvey clung to the medieval Christian notion of the heart as an or organ of compassion, by the time he published his findings, he knew it was also a machine. He insisted on scientific knowledge gained through personal observation and experiment, rather than on reasoning from abstract principles. Uh, some of Harvey's adversaries, such as Descartes, were prepared to believe that the body is a machine just as the deity itself might operate by a kind of celestial mechanics. Um, but God is the principle of the machine. To the question, quote, does the rational immaterial soul have physiological functions, Descartes answered yes. Harvey's science led to answering no. In Harvey's own view, though the human animal has an immaterial soul, God's presence in the world does not explain how the heart makes the blood move. Now, I tell you all of this because it 
this great change in thinking about the body radically altered the kinds of conceptions that our forebearers, urbanists of the 18th century, had about the environments that people build, about poesis. Harvey's revolution helped change the expectations and plans people made for the urban environment. Harvey's findings about the circulation of blood and respiration led to new ideas about public health, for instance, that streets should be cleaned off because people were constantly breathing in fetid air and it was circulated, uh, the fetidity, if you could say that, was circulated through the heart. Um, in the 18th century, Enlightenment planners tried to apply these ideas more directly to urban form. Planners sought to make the city a place in which people could move and breathe freely, a city of flowing arteries and veins through which people streamed like healthy blood corpuscles. This medical revolution seemed to have substituted health for morality as a standard of human happiness. And that's particularly true among the social engineers who applied themselves to the city. Health, rather than morality, became a standard of human happiness, and health was defined by motion and circulation. Now, um, thank you. <laughs> you anticipating me. Um, Enlightenment planners wanted the city in its very design to function like a healthy body, freely flowing as well as possessed of the skin. I show you here, uh, this is a picture of uh, an ideal design for Karlsruhe in it, and, uh, made in the 1740s. What you can see about this design is that the palace of the king, uh, or the elector of, of Karlsruhe, is, as they said, at the heart of the city, which is now not just a metaphor. It's conceived to be the space through which all motion pumps. But there's a new wrinkle in this, because it's also conceived in this plan, as it is in later urban plans, that the exterior, the outer rings, are as much of value as the center. The center is, after all, a mechanical principle. It's an exchange spot, a place of exchange. For the city to be healthy, all of its places have to connect. So you take an old form, you know, all, all the old radial cities that we think of as in earlier eras. These aren't, aren't outer rings to a center. The extremity now becomes as important as the center. And that ultimately has, as I try to ex explain in Flesh and Stone, a great kind of democratic consequence. That people are connected to each other, as they are in the plans, L'Enfant's plans for Washington, D.C., by co the connection of these extremities without having to go there. But this is the first kind of take on looking at the city as literally uh, a circulating uh, medium. Now, as you know, since the beginnings of the Baroque era, urban planners had thought about making cities in terms of efficient circulation of people on the city's main streets. In the remaking of Rome, for instance, Pope Sixtus V connected the principal Christian shrines of the city by a series of great straight roads on which pilgrims could travel. The medical imagery of life-giving circulation gave a new meaning, a new physiological meaning to the Baroque emphasis on ceremonial motion. Instead of planning streets for the sake of ceremonies of movement toward an object like a church or an obelisk, as did the Baroque planner, the Enlightenment planner made motion an end in itself. The Baroque planner emphasized progress, as in progress towards a monumental destination, while the Enlightenment planner emphasized the journey as an experience in and of itself. Uh, could you show the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, the street was an important urban space in this enlightened conception, whether it ran through a residential neighborhood or the city's ceremonial center. I show you here an early plan, 18th century plan, uh, for uh, the Champs-Élysées in Paris. And what's interesting about it is that the designer, whom we don't know, this is a plan of, I think, 1718. 
that the designer said this plan for the Champs Elysees, and particularly this allee, could equally be applied to a garden or to a street. Quote, there is no difference between movement in one space and another. Movement rather than the space through which one moves is what matters. And it's in this way that the very words arteries and veins applied to the cities in the and city streets in the 18th century by designers, was, it's in this very way that the word arteries and veins were applied to cities and streets in the 18th century by designers who sought to model traffic systems and the blood system of the body. French urbanists like Christian Pott used the imagery of arteries and veins to justify the principle, for instance, of one-way streets. I mean, we always think, you know, this is just some kind of, uh, you know, abstract, uh, that it has no grounding. It has a deep grounding that a well, one-way street is more natural in Pott's terms. In both fr uh, German and French urban maps based on the blood system, as I've said, the prince's castle forms the heart of the design, but the streets often bypass the connection to the urban heart and were directly connected to each other. Now, though bad anatomy, the planners practiced a kind of sanguine mechanics. They thought if that motion through the city becomes blocked anywhere, the collective body suffers a crisis of circulation like that of an individual body suffering during a stroke when an artery becomes blocked. Now, to give you an example of this, um, I want to talk about a particular uh, invention of this time. It's the promenade. The promenade has two cultural sources. One of these is the view or the framing of nature like a picture to be enjoyed. But the promenade is a special relationship to that view. Because unlike a picture, uh, uh, unlike a painting, the viewer walks through that which he or she sees. The origins of this aesthetic of the view can be traced back to Montaigne, whose walks are like penetrations of the natural landscape by the moving body, rather than stationary contemplations such as earlier marked the viewing of nature in the, in the Renaissance. Uh, could you show the next slide? I'm, I'm afraid your machine isn't quite. Oh, there it is. There we go. This is Besançon, an ideal, uh, an ideal uh, promenade in Besançon. And what's interesting about it is that the design is not what you can see from here, but the act of walking up this spiral which has conceived itself to be, it's, uh, it's called la, la pénétration de la nature. Right? So you're not looking at, you're moving, moving through. Um, the analogy, I think, today would be our experience of movement in virtual reality, thanks to the machinery of a computer. Like Montaigne, we're inside the scenery that we look at. That's one origin of the promenade. The other source of the promenade is more specifically urban. Could you show the next slide, please? Thanks. The body stimulated by unimpeded walking remedies on the promenade the difficulties of movement experienced in the street. And here's where social issues come in. I'm showing you, obviously, a picture of Bath, uh, 18, uh, 1740s. Promenades is a space of pure circulation. But in the 18th century, such an ideal of bodily movement acquires a specific class character. In earlier eras, unimpeded movement was possible only in great parks, owned either by the aristocracy or the king. The promenade is, by contrast, a bourgeois space. It is a space for and by the bourgeoisie. And indeed, it was an, it, the promenade offers an occasion in which the 18th century bourgeoisie presents itself most publicly in the city, dressing for the walk, treating itself and others as part of the view which in an earlier era Montaigne conceived in floral or geographic terms. It's humanity rather than nature which is on display by being moved through. That's why people didn't look from the window. The notion of looking from the window out onto this spectacle is not an 18th century idea. That comes much later. The notion is that you want to be in it not be a, a, a passive observer of it. 
Now, the classic promenade in cities like Bath occurred from, I'll just tell you a little about this because it's so wonderful, occurred from 4 to 6 in the afternoon. And there were strict rules in, in, in Bath as there were in Paris about the fact that this, there had to be horse manure and human ex excrement had to be swept from the street. But more importantly, by the time the promenade began, that working people also had to be evacuated, forced out of the promenade space. And the only commercial activity permitted during these hours is the selling of ices and flowers. Promenade, in other words, can in, these w in, in its rituals can be seen as a daily event in which the bourgeoisie marks its dominance over the city. And in this regard, I just want to say mo one more detail about this. We shouldn't be misled by the later evolutions of the promenade, such as parades through Hyde Park in London or the Bois de Boulogne at the end of the 19th century in Paris. By that time, the aristocracy has reconquered the territory for such sociability of movement, uh, whereas the bourgeoisie has lost the free time during the day for such movement. The men are imprisoned in their shops or in their offices, while the bourgeois woman has moved inside, into the interiors of department stores, which become interior spaces of promenading, where the act of movement is now joined to the act of consumption. It's a kind of fundamental rearrangement of the notion of what it means to be in public. That when you move, it's gendered. When you move uh, in this promenading way, that you're buying something. Right? You don't move for the sake of moving only or purely as in the early 18th century. In any event, the, uh, could you show the next slide? The 18th century effort to create a promenade space is dramatically illustrated by attempts to use the interior gardens of the Palais Royal for the purpose. Here's a slide, here's a, a, a scene rather of the Palais Royal engraved uh, in the um, uh, eight, uh, seven, uh, this one is 1753, yeah, 1754 maybe. Uh, and you can see what's done here. You have the pollarded trees. People are supposed to move around and round and round. It's an idealized space because, of course, this doesn't exist, this wing, this aileron of it. But the notion is that you would create a kind of enclosure within which the bourgeoisie is really safe. Early 18th century plans for this space emphasized by this idealization its probity in confusion to this uh, uh, street outside. And if you show the next slide. Uh, throughout the 18th century, there are garden designs which aimed at ensuring the physical comfort of the promenaders, including the first efforts at greenhouse architecture adapted for human beings. Here is a century before um, the Crystal Palace, a kind of fantasy of the interior space uh, of that little greenhouse that I just showed you. Uh, this is what uh, they had no means of, of making plate glass, but they, they could imagine, and, and of course it's the origin of the arcade, this, this, this idea for the Palais Royale, a uh, very Benjaminian space uh, in which you're in nature, you can circulate freely, there are no impediments to the outside. Now, what's significant about these attempts is a gradual failure. The Palais Royale cannot, be sh cannot shut out the street. That means the bourgeois cannot create a space of movement which excludes the working classes or dangerous classes of Paris. Can you show the next slide? This great garden, by the time of the Revolution, became the Times Square of Paris, uh, filled with whores and pimps, gamblers and dealers in stolen goods. It attracts, on the one side, the lower echelons of society, and the upper echelons follow in pursuit of pleasure. This is a kind of classic scene of this kind of whorehouse gambling. This is what became to the interior of the Palais Royal by the Revolution. Uh, in his famous evocation of the Galerie du Bois in the Palais Royal, Balzac describes the place as impacted with a human mass which do no longer wants to move. Freedom has become license, and license is expressed in urban terms through a kind of still density rather than through circulation. 
And I'd like to just show you three scenes in the 18th century. These are just taken from popular prints in the 70s, which will give you uh, that idea that life's freedom of, of, in that licentious sense, freedom is density, no longer embodies this Harveyan ideal. Show the next slide. Just to give you an I I idea of it. First, what happens to carriages. Next slide. It should be a famous uh, 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 to all. And then the next slide. Uh, this is from a, a festival procession. The notion that the street becomes against this organic ideal, that the street becomes a place of stillness. And in that still stillness, a kind of sexualization of the street goes on, which they called license. Um, now, that story about the Palais Royal is repeated throughout the 18th century. The organic virtues of movement, which are bourgeois, are contested by the sociology of density. The bourgeoisie cannot insulate itself from other classes through practices conducive to the health of the body. And you can, I think, understand in this some of the origins. In, I, I, well, it's a wonderful book. I don't, I don't mean to criticize it. But it just gives you a little more of the kind of the, the reasons why in Raymond Williams he begins to notice in the 18th century that the bourgeois whom he's reading, who are speaking about the 18th century city, begin to equate it, its unhealthiness with the presence of other classes. It isn't just a metaphor. There's a whole evolution, a whole history of what it means to be unhealthy, which means to be in a dense place where you can't move naturally. And that's class bound. Now, I'd like to talk about a second organ. Oh my god, I'm only through a third of this lecture, and I've kept you here half an hour. So I'll, I'll go more quickly about this. And that's the lung. And this brings me to questions about, uh, I, I won't keep you more than an hour, I promise. Um, um, it's a trouble when you really, I, I mean, I, I have a kind of love of these images that slows one down. I've spoken about the heart as one bodily source of urban design. But Harvey's revolution implicated equally another human organ, which is the lung. The aeration of the blood began to be understood in the 1650s and 1660s. And by the 1680s, doctors had made the modern connection between uh, the pumping of blood in the heart and the work of aeration of the blood in the lungs. Medical knowledge by the 18th century understood that a particular environment best conduced to the joint work of heart and lungs, one in which the respiration of plants interacted with the respiration of the human body though the precise physiology of this interaction was not known. The garden and the natural landscape thus became consequent for the first time for physical health in a way which transcended the poetic virtues of fresh air and peace outside. The floral and the bodily sides of the ideal organic triangle were put in place through scientific research on the lung. So this is a very specific imagery. Uh, and on the third side of this ideal triangle, the lung was as important a reference as the, as the heart to urban enlightenment urban planners. For instance, nothing was more striking in the 18th century Paris than the vast Place Louis XV. Could you show the next slide, please? Though exactly in the center of Paris, it was laid out as a space of free garden growth. And just show the next for a moment. Just to, uh, this is its a contrast to an, er, an earlier design for it, uh, which, was, which was still made under the, under the uh, aegis of, of Renault. Now go back one, if you will. Can you go back one slide? Thank you. No, no, go back one. Thank you. OK. Um, the Potts and Enfants contemporaries knew little about photosynthesis, but they could feel the results when breathing. The Place Louis XV was left to grow into an urban jungle in which people wandered when they wanted to clear their own lungs. The central, the central garden thus came to seem far from urban street life. Uh, as one contemporary said, the Place Louis XV was felt even by those who were fond of its architecture 
uh, by which they mean the statuary, to be outside of Paris. Moreover, this central lung can contravene the power relations which had shaped open space in a royal garden outside the city, like Louis XIV's Versailles or Frederick the Great's Sans Souci. The Versailles gardens built in the mid 17th century disciplined regular lines. You can go to the next slide. Trees, paths, and pools, as I say, this is a pupil, into endless vistas receding to the vanishing point. And in this, the king commanded nature. Another kind of open space appeared in the influential landscape garden of the early 18th century. The boundless gardens, which in the words of our colleague Robert Harrison, uh, Harbison, lacked an obvious beginning or end. The bounds are confused on all sides. The English gardens seized the imagination of all Europeans in irregular, as an irregular space full of surprises as the eye wandered at a bodily body moved, a place of lush and free growth. Now we can see this in visions of the Tuileries or uh, uh, the Place Louis XV as contrasted to older royal parks. Nature is untamed. Can you show the next slide? This is a corresponding image of uh, called Les Tuileries Douces. You know, nature is untamed There's and and you are free in another way. You don't move in this space. You simply in it and you breathe. And such an untamed space contrasts the logic of density in squares, like the Place Royale, later known as the Place des Vosges. If you could just show the next slide, please. I want, what I want to, this is the Place Royale, uh, later the, uh, as I say, the Place des Vosges. I want to show you how the notion of being still in this space differs from that of the Tuileries. Here, it, this is the Turgot map of it. Could you show the next slide? Here's a little what it begins to look like, filled up with people who are milling about. And the next slide. And here's the ground plane of it. It's an entirely different experience of being st uh, still in a place. You are dominated by a monument. It's not a lung. It's an emblem. Right? Something that is set aside from that. L'Enfant's generation sought to give the urban lung, nonetheless, a more defined visual form. And I'll just show you the two next slides uh, just to hurry up. These are attempts to, to give some way of, of, of resolving the Place Louis XV uh, just outside the, the, the Louvre, a kind of connection to the other city. And they're, they're not great plans, but they're interesting. The attempt to, this is all to be lush. This is too regular, uh, but is, is to, uh, the idea was that these trees would grow together and be a kind of canopy. Show the next slide. And this, is, this is an attempt to uh, bridge into that space. This is all, again, all to be lush. These are the origins of the bridges of Paris, of the many bridges. They're not meant as circulation spaces, many of those bridges. They are meant as ways to get in this central lung around this area. There's nothing here to get to. Uh, and even there are, there are technical problems about paying money if you're delivering goods from one side of the city to the other. But bridging is an attempt to get into this idealized space. Um, and again, in these gardens, no commerce is, committed, is, is permitted. It's supposed to be a social space. But the space of the lung, the floral park, unlike the space of the heart, the promenade, was con conceived to be more socially mixed. Indeed, the fact that most of the floral parks in London and Paris were royal preserves mean meant that when open to the people, they were open to all. During its daylight hours of public access, for instance, the Place Louis XV sheltered beggars and the homeless. I'll show you exactly where. They were here, and they were along here. There was an open-air hospital just here, uh, uh, and that's also found in Hyde Park during the 18th century. These are places to be in rather than move through. They're treated as healthy spaces for the entire city. Now, as I say, I, it would be a mistake to think of these parks as in any way democratic. Their access and use was in the gift of the most powerful people in the society. 
And because of this arbitrary control, the floral parks served as the dominant sites for perhaps the greatest experiments made in 18th century urban enlightenment design, experiments in the relationship of self-consciously artificial construction to the order of nature which science seemed in the process of revealing. And that's the third part of the talk, and I want to explain to you why I'm talking about this. One of the great errors, in, I think, in studies of the 18th century is always the opposition of nature and artifice. You know, it's an opposition that begins in the work of Kassirer, Philosophy of the Enlightenment. Uh, and it's a, become a kind of commonplace among scholars. Uh, the notion is that, uh, particularly Rousseau scholars, that the recovery is of the sense of the natural is a kind of critique of artifice. Artifice is something shallow, less profound than nature. But for us as urbanists, we see something quite different that suggests a whole different way of rereading the project of enlightenment, and that is the essential unity of the artificial and the natural. And that's what I want to explain to you in the third part of this talk. Actually, I wanted to spend all my time talking about this, but I don't have it. Pastoral writers since Virgil uh, have evoked the peace the natural world could bring to do those disgusted with the struggle for power or the machinations of ordinary social life. The open relations between human nature and the physical environment as conceived in the 18th century is special in that these enlightened souls believed in no necessary conflict between the natural and the artificial. What men and women make is as natural as what they are in their bodies. Indeed, it's more natural. Consider, for instance, could you show the next slide? This view of Hempstead Heath, made by John Constable, 1821. Now, this looks like nature pure and untamed, a kind of great, late, uh, enlightened Im image of the natural. But in fact, the view was contrived in the 1780s. Every element of it, the paths, the trees, and the meadow flowers were planted according to a design. It's all carefully worked out. This is a plan, all of this. The particular trees were chosen. The gravel on the path was very carefully chosen and crushed. Uh, this is graded completely. It's a completely uh, designed space. In the 18th century, a whole science of artificially simulating the natural developed. Prompt by the view, prompted by the view that both circulation and respiration, the heart and the lung, needed the designer's intervening hand in order to become more of themselves. For instance, the Enlightenment gardener sought to aid nature and provision the pleasures of walking. Flâner, as you know, means in French to stroll along, observing, and a flâner is one who delights in doing so. This stroll, as it becomes it comes uh, uh, to be designed in the 1760s, was not in nature, was not as quite as passive a surrender as it might first seem. The planners of the English Guard of the 18th century designed clever devices to simulate an illusion of the lack of restraint in nature. I'll just give you an example of one of these. It's the haw-haw. Can you show the next slide, if you please? This famous slide at Petworth. You can see that the Petworthians, the worthy Petworthians, are here in a terrace, a little haw-haw between them, and here are the famous Petworth uh, deer running seemingly loose. Oddly enough, they never seem to run onto the terrace. Uh, there's no deer shit that, you know, you have to worry about strolling out here. But every nature seems to be incredibly uh, free. If you can show the next slide. And here's an example from Doddington Hall of actually how a haw-haw is constructed. The land has sunk a bit in the last two centuries, but originally it comes up to here, the cattle low. You're out here, I don't know what you drank in the 18th century. Uh, I would drink a martini here, but I don't know what the, they did. But you looked out into this nature and, and, and so on. You can see exactly what happens here. From the ground at some distance, might, one might see cattle and horses roaming in the field and think the animals were free to wander and miraculously they never, s they never s uh, strayed. Now, just to tell you something about this device, the haw-haw is, is adapted 
from the paved ditches dug around medieval bastides of the sort that you'd see at Cork, for instance, where the wall and the ditch were conceived as one defensive unit. In the 17th century, French gardeners began to use both paved and earthen ditches without walls to define the edges of formal gardens. The fence in the trough was to keep people out as well as animals. Early in the 18th century, English gardeners then began to play with making the device both more irregular following the serpentine shifts in the ground. Just think back to Petworth, that's what happens there. Uh, and more nearly invisible by building up both sides, and that's what you see here at Dovington Hall. The historian David Watkin thinks that uh, Van Bro is the key figure in making this change, which is certainly right. But the taste for this illusion was widespread ab ab among people without much visual training, as well as among the emerging class of professional improvers and landscape designers. Moreover, the illusion in the Jardin Anglais of free-roaming animals mixing with strolling human beings soon caught on in continental Europe and provincial America. I'd like to just read you one uh, passage from Horace Walpole about the, if you like, the semiotics of the ha-ha. The destruction of walls for boundaries and the invention of fosse uh, uh, ditches and, uh, is an, a, an attempt then was then deemed so astonishing at the time this building was made that the common people called them ha-ha to express their surprise at finding a sudden and unperceived check to their walk. The contiguous ground of the park without the sunken fence was to be harmonized with the lawn within, and the garden in its turn was to be set free from its prim regularity that it might assort with the wilder country without. Just uh, the phrase I'd like to focus on is set free from its prim regularity that might assort with the wilder country without. Now certainly that's true, but it, what delighted people about this artifice was the illusion that on the grounds of a state you have this mixing of nature. No one was unconscious of the device. One's pleasure in this kind of artifice was increased by the knowledge that the artificer had a hand in creating it. That is, this is a highly self-conscious mode of thinking about the relationship between design, the freedom of the body to move, uh, and, and illusion. The knowledge that one's looking at in illusion is where the real pleasure comes from. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a really double consciousness. Now, that's also true, and this is the only other thing about gardens I will uh, talk to you about, with the actual pr abundance of bloom in a garden. As you know, in the beds of the 18th century English garden, profusion and carefully calculated disorder were created by mixing species of flowers from different parts of the world the flowers of differing blooming periods and the foliage contrasting. This planting technique expressed the same desire to create an environment of seemingly untamed, ever productive free growth, among which it was possible, however, also to stroll even if one was wearing a wide pannier skirt. By chance, nature had also provided a winding alley of crushed stone to walk on. The landscape gardeners of the Enlightenment felt no contradiction between illusion and freedom in all the styles of the state and garden design that span the age, from William Kent's early efforts in Kensington Gardens to create informality in nature, surely an odd conjunction in theory, to make nature informal, um, to the taste for chinoiserie or for Gothic ruins, and the construction of the new safe ruin posed an exciting engineering challenge in the 1770s, down to Humphrey Repton's red books which contain his recipes for moving large bodies of earth and heavy rocks in order to arouse picturesque visions of untamed nature. Through division, devices like the ha-ha or the careful interplanting of differing flowering species in the same spot, the age literally cultivated the sense of bodily freedom in nature. And I just show you two Three more slides, and then I, I will conclude. Uh, could you show the next slide? This, um, we focused a little bit, well, I don't see it. This is the Jardin de Plantes as it was originally laid out 
And what it is is both a botanical collection agency and a factory to produce uh, plants out of season. This is the factory for the ever-blooming English garden. That's what the king's gardeners wanted it to be. That you could take out of these pots so that, you know, February you would have orchids blooming, that nature was always abundant, was always like a cornucopia. Uh, so there's something almost industrial about the sense of that natural garden. And we as gardeners, or I hope you're gardeners, uh, repeat that kind of industrialization of nature when we try and mix plants from different countries so that we have gardens that are constantly, uh, constantly productive. And just to show you the last two slides, I'd like to uh, if you could show this is just what happened to Blenheim. This is the original layout of Blenheim. And uh, in, in uh, I think this is 1709 this comes from. And the next, and this is how it was remade. It's incredible what's happened here. All of this is new. This is still retained. The house is still here. But there's a massive re-sculpting of the entire uh, uh, of the entire landscape to make it look more natural. All these trees are bald and burlapped and brought in on great wagons s because they're mature trees, right? To give at a stroke the notion that nature is uh, full, that there's nothing that's uh, uh, that this is the way it always was, and the delight in this remaking of Blenheim was to see the artificer's hand so monumentally at work in this space. Now, why do I tell you all of this? Because there uh, is a certain kind of moral about the relation between body, garden, and building, body, nature, and building, contained in this 18th century story. On the one hand, what is seen here is the notion of a cornucopia, of a nature which is overflowing. It goes back to the Harveyan notion, if you remember that second slide I showed you of the body with all the, the, uh, the tree-like uh, appendages growing out of it. The body is bursting with life. That's what circulation does, movement does. It creates a kind of overwhelming vividness of life. But on the other hand, the cornucopia is not quite a sufficient image of enlightenment plenty, of what the morality of these notions of body, building, and nature are about. When Rousseau wrote in the Nouvelle Eloise of nature as a teacher of enthusiasm, he meant that na awareness of nature would tame Eloise and set the context of her spontaneous outbursts. For it makes no difference to the uh, succession of seasons that she s loves or suffers. One might derive from these natural rhythms, as did the elderly Rousseau, even some peace of mind. Storms come and go, storms in the countryside, and storms in the soul. That is to say that nature is full, but in the rhythm of the day or the seasons, she does not come to grief because she does not overflow. That is, that nature has limits. And similarly, those surprising precipices and surging waterfalls that wrapped and delighted and contriving never put the flaneur at risk. They're meant to be stimulating rather than overwhelming. The relation between nature and artifice, in other words, is also a kind of moral teacher about the limits of people to be pushed beyond themselves. And this was the Enlightenment antidote to inward subturning subjectivity, inward distress, enthusiasm. What one saw in nature and what one experienced by moving through its picture was an exemplary scene, a scene full of life, but a life-given shape. The viewer has aided that landscape to be more of itself. Those who preferred such engaging views became, as they s people said in the 18th century, true sons and daughters of nature. But that meant worldly creatures, purposeful, graceful, and above all, modest. Our forebears were more comfortable 
with the notion of artifice as a teacher of modesty than we are. Um, indeed, their ideals of the organic made them so. They had a distinct sense of exposure from the early bourgeois wanting to expose themselves on the promenade to this heroic sense of creating a natural world in one which one, thanks to design, would roam free or the, the notion of exposure that you saw in the constable painting. Uh, but exposure uh, was to a natural world that goes on and on, no matter how sad or complicated or unfulfilled its inhabitants are inside themselves. In other words, what I've shown you today is a kind of recipe for dealing with the great fear that begins to take place in early modernity. That is the fear that subjectivity itself is unbounded, that subjectivity may depass the limits of the body, that subjectivity might be an autonomous operation akin without any kind of godly reassurance to the operations that used to be called the soul. And what all of, I would argue to you, all of these designs are about is about a cultural mindset that seeks through the act of building to create a sense of artifice, of connection to the natural world, artificial connection to the natural world, which ultimately addresses the notion of uh, the restraints upon inner life which are now cut free from uh, the sacred. These are secularizing spaces, these spaces of the body and these places of the body. Now, let me just conclude. I'll just try our patience for one second more by saying, uh, you may gather that this is an era I would have liked to have uh, lived in. My critics constantly reproach me for, for for uh, being a great, uh, having a great longing for the 18th century, that's absolutely true. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't have liked to have been poor in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there is, nonetheless, this vision goes wrong because it contains within itself a fatal flaw. Uh, there is a fatal flaw in this conception of the organic city. Now, of course, we could say that reality is bound to contravene the dreams of uniting nature and poesis, the bodily, the floral, and the artificial. Yet within this enlightenment vision of the organic, it was contained the seeds of its own destruction. If you like, the values of circulation attached to the heart proved dominant in a developing capitalism over the values of respiration, a dwelling in place associated with the lung. And I don't mean to conclude with this as a poetic play on the imagery of the body. Because that new understanding of the body, that Harveyan understanding of the body, coincided with the birth of modern capitalism. And indeed, it helped to bring in the great uh, transformation that we think of as market society. Uh, the modern mobile individual, uh, the modern capitalist individual is above all a mobile human being. Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations first reckoned, indeed, what Harvey's discoveries would lead to in this regard. For Smith imagined the free market of labor and goods operating much like freely circulating blood within the body and with similar life-giving consequences. Yet for people to benefit from the virtues of a circulating economy, Smith knew, they would be obliged to cut themselves free from old alliances. They would have to be free to move around, exploit possessions and skill as the market offered, but all at a price. Gradually, they would lose through the very act of circulation that kind of morality of self-restraint, of self-knowledge, uh, the restraint on subjectivity, that marked the idealization of the organic in the 18th century. I'll show you a p final pair of images. Can we show the next? This is, as you, as you know, the Boulevard Richard Renoir after Haussmannization. And contrast it to, if you go back to the, uh, to the next image, please, to a plan for the Champs-Élysées pre-Haussmann made in the 1840s. This is still a 
a plan of the Enlightenment, and if you go back uh, to the Houseman slide, just go back one. Thank you. This plan is about what happens to circulation ultimately under the logic of capitalism. Uh, now, what you see here is, first of all, that the floral, which is this, has become a, a mere jest. What's really important about this street design is the total divorce of the street from the fabric around it. This is meant to get uh, people in and out of Paris as quickly as possible. The working class district, as you know, the notion is that in times of trouble, you get off the side lanes, you get in the center, and you move out. The width of the street is carefully calculated uh, to contain two wagons on uh, uh, abreast moving down the street onto which uh, guns are fitted to fire into the working class district. All very calcula calculated. The notion is here that space is dis or, or I should say density is finally disconnected uh, from motion and this space of movement lined with shops for consumption is a bourgeois territory in which flight now becomes the dominant image of urban circulation. Getting out of city, getting away from trouble, escape. That's what this Haussmannian street is about, escape. And indeed, that's the way it was used during, uh, I tell you this is what it means, but that's the way it was used in the commune uh, and uh, in, in the 1930s as well. Now, what I would argue about this, and you know this perhaps from some of my other work, is that moving around freely in this way diminishes sensory awareness, diminishes arousal by any of this, by places or the people in those places. Any strong visceral connection to the environment threatens to tie the individual down. This, as you may know, was a premonition expressed at the end of The Merchant of Venice. To move freely, to circulate, you can't feel too much. And it is that disassociation, thanks to circulation, which has really become the fate of the modern city. Today, as the desire to move freely has triumphed over the sensory claims of the space through which the body moves, the modern mobile individual has suffered a kind of tactile crisis. Motion has helped to desensitize the body. The Harveyan relation, uh, the revolution has come full circle. Motion no longer gives life. It brings a kind of sensory death in the city. You know, you know what I'm talking about when you're inside an automobile. You don't, you're not feeling too much about the spaces you're moving through, except when they block you from moving. There's a long history in which the notion of circulation of life ends in our time in which the technologies of circulation and the designs for circulation bring a kind of sensory death. This general principle we now see realized in cities given over to the claims of traffic and rapid individual movement, cities filled with neutralized spaces, cities which have succumbed to the dominant values of circulation, which no longer are places to be in. And uh, I'm sorry to end on a very dark note. That's a good reason to take, it's why, and it's why I take so seriously the kinds of cross currents of idealization about the body, its relation to the natural world, and to build form in the Enlightenment. Thank you very much. No. Questions? No. Let's <laughs> uh, no. No. Okay. okay. Just as you like. Okay. You have an announcement. We do. We have an announcement, by the way. Very important. Is this wrong that I don't want to answer questions? Well, uh, it's up to you, entirely up to you. I'm sure there are a lot of questions, but it's only if you feel like All right. the idea to uh, Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Make your announcement. I feel a little guilty about this. I, I usually, I'm very slow on my feet, so I don't do well with this, but oh, I'll, I'll answer some questions if I can think fast enough. Yeah, all right, all right. Okay.
So you will? I will. Okay. Uh, you bear with me. Oh, another right. question. Well, <laughs> make your announcement. <laughs> you give your announcement, Bob, yeah. and we can, uh, we can see how this feels. The announcement was, was, was simply that um, although one gets a little hesitant about making an announcement about people winning competitions uh, from the AA, uh, it does look as though the BNA extension has actually been won by Danny Liebeskind. So, great. So you see it's worthwhile spending all this money. I will answer some questions. You have so, one. Yeah. Do, do people want to raise some questions? Well, having, having gone through this. Since I'm shy, you can't be shy. I mean, that's not. No. Okay. I know. Okay. Oh, wait. There is a question. All right. What is your question? have to speak up. The comment is a uh, question related to what you said about uh, subjectivity. And uh, oh, this would help. Um, Thank you. Um, and and uh, I I subjectivity in relation to these ideas, these strategies of urban planning based on, on circulation and, and breathing and whatnot. And I was wondering, as you could make that clearer, perhaps, if as a, a counter case, you would say something about something like the planning of, of, say, Versailles, which is based on the line of sight, which right. presumably also then has a kind of a biological um, strategy at, at its base. But I, I, I think you were, you were suggesting that, that this notion of subjectivity is an enlightenment one. Well, actually what Versailles is based on is something is a very different convention, which is the, does this work? Yeah which is the convention in palaces of uh, the notion of courtesy. All the lines within the palace are about how far a king or a minister will go to receive someone else. The enfilade is a series of rooms, as in Italian palazzi, where uh, what you're trying to calculate is how far, say, if I'm a minister from Venice and I come to see Louis XIV, how far uh, out of his inner chamber he comes along this enfilade to see me. And it's all laid out very carefully. When the first gentleman of the bedchamber picks me up and takes me into the cage, I mean, the, the, the notion of linearity is a notion of precedence and of hierarchy, something we don't see because we just look at these as flat things. There's a social hierarchy expressed by linear movements. So it's a it's a total convention, not of who you are or what you experience, but of what your standing is. And that's something which in a lot of 17th and 18th century houses is in turn ref derived from the reflection of this kind of royal notion of the line, which is movement along the line is movement that's entirely orchestrated by social place. There is no subjectivity in it. Uh, in the parks, the same thing operates. When you look at those long vistas, you think, great, you know, go all the way along them. But not so. The degree to which you can travel in the, the park is rigidly determined by uh, how much, uh, what, what your standing is as at the court. The farther you get away, the greater your standing. So the, the, the sort of menu courtier, uh, court, courtiers, are people who are sort of bound by convention to stay rather close to the Palace of Versailles itself. There's no volonté, there's no will in that nature. Everything is regulated, all movement is regulated by rank. And what happens in the 18th century is that's all taken apart. The notion is, and science is used, the science that I've described to you, is used to take apart that notion that linear movement is hierarchical by rank in society. Another principle is, is, is inserted, 
much more, as I, try, as I tried to point out, bourgeois in a way in the early part of the century. That you move for the sake of health rather than, as it were, for the sake of social standing. And that's where you begin to get a whole different set. Then you're focused on, well, who am I who is moving? Yeah. Uh, if I'd had the time, there's another part of this paper which is about uh, Rousseau's uh, uh, promenades and about the kinds of connection he makes explicitly between free movement and the notion of both feeling his subjectivity, feeling his body, and also feeling that in some way the body is temporizing uh, whatever kinds of inner distress, romantic Sturmendrang he's having. You have an ex uh, this is a very bourgeois trope after all, right? That I am within myself, my individuality, and so on. In which the body is a kind of temperer of, you know, of, the, of, of the soul. But it's something that is a radical break, that notion of movement from what comes before. And then itself is broken by the notion of the kind of absolutes of motion, something you'd know from, we know from Henri Lefebvre, for instance, that in modern capitalism, circulation then takes on, in the 19th and 20th century, again, a whole other different form in which there is no subjectivity at work in movement. There is indeed no sociability at work in it either. So it's that kind of historical placement I think is important in this. And it's important architecturally because we misread all of these plans. We look at them as geometries and their sociologies and, and sciences rather than simply, um, you know, uh, geometric drawing. There's a very, very different uh, kind of placement historically. I don't know if this answers your no, it, it, it does. Okay. I mean, I was ac actually in another case, I suspect you'd say the same thing is, is Sixtus V's Rome laid out along lines of sight. Right. Well, there, I mean, for Sixtus V, the Baroque planner, that is a ceremonial space. You know, he finds the streets in Paris by moving from one of these churches to the next, right? What's the best way to progress? It's not the shortest distance. Right? He it's a whole archaeological uncovery of what ceremony would mean in the city. The rapidity of getting from one place to another is meaningless for Sixtus V, right? There again, it's a ceremonial movement, although now religiously charged. Uh, you want to go as slowly as you can, the greater the monument. You don't want it to be over. It's like having a sort of quick fix prayer. You don't want that. You want, you know, a long sustained experience. So that circulation takes on a positive value by its slowness. Right? There's more experience you have of it as a, a problem. So that's, that's again, another way in which, um, I mean, I don't know. I know it's possible to over-historicize. I mean, our eyes do the work that we do in looking at what's come before us and all we can know is what we see. But in urban terms, we've had such incredible changes in the kind of morphology of the city that, you know, are consequent on these kind of changes in modernization and modern culture. But I think it's very important to sort of know what basic things like forward, rapid, slow, how, how historically embedded these are, you know, both power relations and, and sociable relations. And that's what I'm trying to get at in, in, in this. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Well, I'll go drink. Very good. Thank you very much for coming.